Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Again today, if you don't know me, my name is Andrew and I have the privilege of serving along with June and Zion as pastors here. And this morning now we turn to God's Word together. Um, Many of you know we're in a sermon series that started last Sunday, taking us through the book of Genesis. And we'll be in Genesis until June of next year with some breaks around Advent and Lent. So we're just beginning and... We're remaining this morning in chapter 1, talking about what it means to be made in the image of God, which is a remarkable thing that the Bible teaches us in Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. And I'd like to read those verses with us at this time. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. This is the word of God. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Thus far, our reading from God's word. This morning, I want to begin by talking about this idea of being made in the image of God from what you might call a a worldly perspective. Pretend, just for a moment, not for too long, because we are in church (laughs) worshiping God, just pretend for a moment that none of us here were religious in any sense, that we just believed in the material world. We are material creatures that have evolved over many, many thousands of centuries. And let's ask ourselves this this very strange question. Why is it that people hold on to the belief that we as human beings have intrinsic value? Let's ask ourselves about this very strange notion that many people in the modern Western world, in fact, for many centuries, have believed in what really is one of the foundations of Western civilization, that human beings are made in the image of God. Where on earth does that strange idea come from? I mean... As pure materialists, people who believe in matter and the reality of of only a material world, where does this strange idea come from that human beings are made in the image of God? I mean, listen to what Bertrand Russell wrote over a century ago, a British mathematician and philosopher. We are the product of causes that had no pre-vision of the end they were achieving. The hopes, fears, loves, and beliefs of our minds are just the outcome of the accidental co-location of atoms. Or think about these words from Oliver Wendell Holmes, a chief justice in the United States back in the early 20th century. He writes, scientifically, I see no reason for attributing to a man a significance different in kind from that which belongs to a baboon or a grain of sand. Not a particularly high view of humanity, but if you're a materialist, a perfectly understandable one. And you know, if you believe in a purely material perspective, as these individuals do, and of course many others in our day do, then the significance of being a human being is no different than the significance of a baboon or even, excuse me, a piece of wood. 
But here, here's the fact of the matter. Neither of those two gentlemen that I just mentioned, or anyone, quite frankly, who holds to this teaching or understanding, none of them in practice treat other people like they are baboons or grains of sand. I mean, maybe some do, the really twisted kinds of people. No one treats others like they're just, you know, accidental co-locations of atoms. And let me try to make my point by inviting us to consider whether the topic of human beings actually having free will is, is true. I mean, true materialists deny the existence of free will. Human beings are not able to freely choose this or that behavior or outcome because they're just a conglomeration of, of water and tissue and bones, all chemically controlled by electrical impulses that go up and down to the brain. We're just biochemical machines, and machines don't have free will. Listen to a quote from Francis Crick back in the 1990s. He wrote a book called The Astonishing Hypothesis, The Scientific Search for the Soul. He says, you, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Who you are is nothing but a pack of neurons, end quote. But I say again, here's the thing. In practice, we don't treat people as if they don't have free will. Try treating your spouse that way just for a day or two or your best friend and see how that works for you. You won't have a spouse or a friend for very long. You see, in practice, we treat most everybody as though they are free. And a very good case can be made, I think, that if in practice we do that, we do that because we're acting out what we believe to be true, that people are free to choose. So while it might be that people say we don't have free will, their behavior, I submit, would contradict it. And the reason why in practice most people we know treat others as though they have free will, and more than that, the reason why in practice most people believe that every human being has intrinsic value, and because of that basic human rights, the reason why is precisely the text we read this morning, Genesis 1 verse 26 and 27. Mankind is created in the image of God. In a book that was written about five years ago by a British historian named Tom Holland, a book called Dominion, The Making of the Western Mind, I've quoted that a few times, and I would say it's probably one of the most influential books, I think, written in recent history. He writes about the profound impact that a person named Jesus and Paul had on the development of Western civilization. Listen to what he writes. That we are all of us possessed of certain fundamental rights simply by being, by virtue of being human and of a dignity that embraces our entire species are doctrines so widely accepted in contemporary Britain, he's British, and America, that many of us barely recognize them as doctrines at all. That's how influential they are in Western society. Now, listen to this British historian in a book, Inventing the Individual. His name is Larry Seidentop. He writes this, Christian moral beliefs particularly the idea that human beings are created in the image of God, 
provide the foundation for the emergence of the concept of individual rights. It was a belief that granted each person a unique moral worth and encouraged the development of ideas like equality before the law and personal freedom. End quote. That we accept this understanding of the human species is because quite literally what Genesis 1.26 teaches us is in the cultural air that we breathe, even though many people don't even recognize it or admit it. You see, the fact of the matter is, for most of human history and for many cultures in the world, it wasn't always this way. Through most of human history, people didn't think that way about others. And if you pause for a moment and think about the way that contemporary culture, at least many, understand evolution as a kind of long period of time, the stronger surviving, the weaker. I mean, why shouldn't the stronger make use of the weaker? Why not? What's wrong with it? Or why shouldn't the smarter people control those who are, you know, less intelligent? Wouldn't we all want a world run by very smart people? I mean, that was Israel's experience in Egypt, in a sense. Last week we talked about how Genesis, at least traditionally, has been understood to have been given to the people of Israel, likely when they were wandering in the wilderness, as it was written or received by Moses, their leader. Think about Israel's own experience. The Egyptians had absolutely no problem perceiving Israel, the Hebrews, as slave labor so that they could build their cities. And Pharaoh had no problem at all issuing an order to kill all the male Hebrew babies that were born. After all, they were a threat to his empire and he was the one made in the image of God so he was the one capable of in that case taking the lives of these slaves I mean remember how we talked at least briefly about the religions in Israel's day back in say the third century BC third millennium rather remember how we talked about the origin accounts that likely Israel would have been familiar with the origin accounts of say ancient Egypt or Babylon or Mesopotamian religions listen to what the Babylonian origin account says when it describes Marduk the chief god creating the heavens and the earth he did so by splitting the corpse of a dragon in half, one half casting the heavens, the other half casting the earth, and said, I will make man who shall inhabit the world that the service of the gods may be established and their shrines built. And the story goes on that instead of having his lesser gods, his lesser deities, be committed to perpetual work, he created humanity out of a sticky compound of dust and blood in order that they might serve the gods as slaves. Remember last week I mentioned that there are a number of points of contact with those ancient origin stories from Mesopotamian peoples or Egyptian and Genesis 1 through 11. Well, there we have an instance of that. The mentioning of, of how dust was used to create humankind. But notice the key difference. That Babylonian account speaks of a sticky mixture of dust and blood so that they could be slaves of the gods in Genesis 1. 
It's dust being formed by the hand of God and animated with the very breath of God, the life of God, so that they could be his image bearers. Well, you're saying to yourself maybe, well, Andrew, today nobody believes in those ancient origin accounts of Egypt or Babylonian. Nobody believes in them anymore. And of course, you're right if you say that. And if I might digress for just a moment, and yet the origin account that we find in the Bible, the one held by the Judeo-Christian tradition, that has lasted to this very day, at least the belief that every human being has intrinsic worth. That has lasted to this very day. And maybe that should tell us something. Like perhaps it's true. But I digress. Think about this with me. Yes, the ancient stories of human beings being the product of, of God's taking dust and blood and creating them to serve as slaves. Yes, that view of human beings is long gone. In that view, human beings have no dignity or intrinsic value. But let me ask this question, how different is that than what contemporary scientists say today? That we are just an accidental co-location of atoms. That we have no more significance than a baboon or a grain of sand. It would seem to me that those statements maybe even give less human dignity to a person than the ancient Egyptians or Babylonians. And yet here we live in a culture that's always talking about human rights. A culture that continues to believe for the most part in the intrinsic worth and dignity of each and every human being. Why? Well, because God through his prophet named Moses, revealed to his people, rescued from slavery, that he had created them in his image, male and female. So, what is it that Genesis means by claiming that, that all people are made in the image of God? What I'd like to do is take the remainder of the message to describe that. And what I want to do is to do that in four slightly different but related ways. What does it mean that we are made in the image of God, in the likeness of God? Well, certainly this understanding that we are made in the image of God is a way of describing or capturing the uniqueness of humankind over against any and all other creatures, man's uniqueness. In fact, we see that already in the instructions given to mankind in Genesis, right? All the other animals were called to multiply and fill the earth as were humans. But we uniquely were called to subdue the earth. And to have dominion over the earth. That language of subdue is an interesting word in Hebrew. Sometimes people want to try and translate it more positively. Like bring forth the, the fruit of the earth or the resources or the blessings of the earth. That really doesn't capture the meaning quite frankly. It, it's really more of a, a, in some sense, a negative meaning. There's a sense in which the word subdue is implying that creation will not do man's bidding gladly or easily. That's how one scholar captures it. And that man now is entrusted with bringing creation into submission through work, through strength. 
Now, we can imagine twisting that such that humankind justifies plundering the earth, abusing the good creation of God. That's certainly not contained in the word. But understanding that to bring forth the fruit of the earth, the resources of the earth, takes hard work. We know that. If you're a gardener, bringing forth the beauty of creation in a garden, it takes hard work. Last summer, I had a project in which I built a little pond in my backyard. And I can tell you, it was hard work digging a hole and bringing all these rocks in to make it, to outline it. In part, anytime you and I do something where we, as it were, like last week, hover over the, the potential or the chaos of the earth, it, it, it takes work. And that's what's invoked in this word subdue that we find in Genesis. And we're called to have dominion over. And one of the ways that we might think about that is illustrated in Genesis 2. We'll talk about that when we get there. But the fact that humankind was given the task of naming all the animals. In the mind of the ancient Near East, that was a way of exercising dominion. Having leadership over by assigning names to all of the animals. Now, we see the uniqueness of human beings in countless different ways as we think about ourselves compared to other creatures. Obviously, human beings are completely unique from all the other animals. Even though we share about 98% of our genetic structure with chimpanzees, I mean, that's a lot. We share most of our genome, our genetic structure with chimpanzees, but yet we are completely different than chimpanzees. Think about the capacity of human beings to express themselves artistically. I mean, just look at a painting like this. At one point in the week, I said to Marianne, yep, there you are hovering over this, this tray of paints and brushes and palettes. There you are hovering over it, and by God's grace in your mind's eye, you're beginning to see what the potential of that might be, and, and there we have it. And that's true for any and all of us who are about some form of artistic expression, and I mean that in the broadest sense. Whether it's writing music, playing music, literature, landscaping, construction, you name it. Language, that might be the very heart of what distinguishes us. Now, some have said, well, you know, you can teach chimpanzees language. And to some degree, that's true. They've done that with sign language. Chimpanzees can be taught a basic form of communication. But you know what chimpanzees can't do? Is they can't teach their children how to communicate that way. They simply don't even have the capacity to, to apprehend language unless they're given a kind of bait and switch sort of teaching that we do with them. They don't even have that capacity, nor does any other animal that we know of at all. Wholly unique is what human beings are. That's one way of describing what it means to be created in the image of God. A second way of thinking about it is by drawing up this image. It's the image of a signet ring. Think about a ring that a, a pharaoh or an emperor would wear, a ring that he would use to, to stamp documents with wax, ensuring that people who would read whatever that declaration was in the document would read it as though it were coming from his own mouth. We have a picture here of a, a signet ring that's been discovered, likely used by an ancient Egyptian pharaoh. 
And on it is what we would describe, and in the ancient language, is described as the image of the king. The same word is used to describe that image that is used in Genesis 1.26, when God says, let us make mankind in our image. And this image, as I said, would be stamped on edicts or declarations that would be distributed throughout the empire. It would be found on temples or on columns or on markers in the empire so that everyone would know this empire falls under the authority, under the dominion of this king because this is his image. Now, some scholars believe that it's this image that's being evoked in Genesis 1, where we are, as it were, God's signet ring. All human beings, stamps of the divine, and called on his behalf to extend his dominion and his authority and his glory across the whole earth as we multiply and fill the earth. What a beautiful image. Now I want you to remember that word glory that I just said, for it too is an important idea for us to think about as we, as we try to understand what it means to be made in the image of God. A third way of understanding what it means to be made in the image of God is to picture an angled mirror. An angled mirror. Imagine a large mirror held at an angle that's able to reflect what's on the horizon up and what's able to reflect what's in the heavens across the horizon. This image I first heard about from Tom Wright. And what I appreciate about it is that it expresses the dynamic nature of what it means to be made in God's image. God has called us to function, as it were, like an angled mirror. Where you and I, we receive and reflect the glory of God into the world. Like an angled mirror reflects the image from above across the horizon. That's our task, is to, to be those instruments of God that, that reflect his glory as we receive it from God. And more than that, we also, we also bring the beauty, the praise of creation and offer that up back to God. There's this beautiful, dynamic quality of receiving glory from God and, and reflecting it into the world like an angled mirror and taking the, the beauty of the world, the beauty of creation, the, the fruits of the earth, and offering that back up to God in praise. Made in the image of God. And finally, really as a way of expanding on that view of of being an angled mirror. Being made in the image of God is our calling to reflect and refract, if you will, the character of God into the world. Here's what I mean by that. I want us to think about the story that we encounter in Exodus chapter 33 and 34. Some of you will remember that story. Just after the people of Israel had constructed this golden calf and started worshiping that golden calf, you'll remember how upset God was and upset Moses was. Now Moses, we find in chapter 33, is in the tent of meeting. And he pleads with the Lord, Lord, you have called me to lead these people. And I can't lead them unless your presence goes with us. And listen to what he says, Exodus chapter 33. You have been telling me lead these people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You've said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I might know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. 
And so the Lord instructs Moses to cut two new stone tablets and bring those tablets with him once again up Mount Sinai. And as Moses is there up with the Lord, he asks the Lord, show me your glory. Show me your glory. And the Lord says, well, I can't, you can't see me face to face, but you can see my, my back and I will show you my glory. And so we read about this happening in Exodus 34. And the Lord passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. He doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Now, you might be saying, okay, Andrew, where are you going with this in the image of God? Well, we find out that the glory of God is actually quite connected to the image of God. And if we're asking ourselves, well, what is the glory of God? Well, very interestingly, when, when Moses was captivated by that glory, he came to understand and hear who God was. He came, he was encountered by the character of God. A God who is gracious. A God who is compassionate. A God who is filled with love and abounding with faithfulness. A God of justice. The glory of God quite literally was, was in front of Moses because Moses beheld the character of God. And when Moses came back down from the mountain, he was filled with that glory, right? They had to put a veil over his face because people couldn't look at him. The glory of God was so much manifest that he was veiled. And the New Testament says that that is kind of a metaphor, a picture. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel... They, as it were, lived amongst a veiled glory. But in the New Testament, with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's people encounter an unveiled glory. We read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We all who with unveiled faces. Clearly, Paul is drawing on this story in Exodus chapter 34. We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. We're being transformed into his image. There you have it. The connection between the glory of the Lord and the image of God. We are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In fact, you have this language in 2 Corinthians of us being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. And what Paul will write in Colossians 3 taking this image of, of being transformed with ever-increasing glory and thinking about how Paul represents that in Colossians when he invites us to put on the new self. That is, the new self remade in Jesus Christ. Paul says, and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and in the image of its creator. This new self, well, what is that? Well, Paul will go on right after in verse 12 of Colossians chapter 3. This is what that new self looks like. You're God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Paul calls us... To put on the very qualities and characteristics of God. Those qualities are not unlike the ones that were revealed to Moses back in Mount Sinai centuries earlier. 
Now, Paul says, as we receive the glory of God through the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine, we are transformed, renewed in the very image of God so that we might display his character. We're his signet rings. We're the ones who reflect the character and the quality of God into the world so that they might behold him, so that they might see him, so that they might be drawn into relationship and bring right praise to him. For that is the basic call of what it means to be human, to bring right praise to our God. This, my friends, is such an ennobling view of what it means to be human. And I'm imagining any person who thinks about themselves, I'm not worth much. Any person who wrestles with depression or with shame and says, my life's not worth much. I'm thinking about any person who might wrestle with those kinds of feelings, and many of us do at various times in our lives, being encountered by this core teaching of the Word of God. You are made in His image. You are His signet ring. You are called to reflect the character and the glory of God into the world. I'm imagining anybody who wrestles with feelings of shame or despair thinking, oh, that changes everything, doesn't it? Now, you and I know we don't reflect the glory of God perfectly. We're not at Genesis 3 yet. We'll get there. We don't reflect the glory of God perfectly. And on account of our disobedience, what did God do? He sent his son, who we heard earlier in our service, is the firstborn of the dead. He is the true image of God. That's Jesus. And through his presence and power in our lives, as he forgives our sins, as he fills us with his spirit, he renews us by his own presence so that we might reflect the image of the living God to the world. We'll get there in Genesis 3 and beyond. But I leave with us this day the beautiful ennobling picture a view that so many in our culture still, whether they believe in Christianity or not, hold on to. Not realizing that that teaching did not come out of 17th century modernity or the Enlightenment, as many atheists will claim. It did not come from the Enlightenment or modernity. It came from the very Word of God. Thanks be to God for the grace that he shows us as he affirms the human dignity that he's created us with. Let's shine forth the glory of God in the ordinary ways that you and I live our lives. And all God's people said, Amen.